Today, I'm speaking uh, for myself in a sort of personal capacity as a Linux maintainer, uh, rather than anything to do with ARM. So, um, yeah, today uh, I'm here to give you a, a whistle stop tour of embedded Linux. So, um, so the, the goal here is to um, give you an overview of the embedded Linux landscape and um, point you in the direction of some interesting projects that are out there and give you some ideas for the um, sort of things that people uh, do with Linux in the embedded space and how people work with Linux in the embedded space. Um, because it's covering a huge area, it's going to be a fairly or a very high level talk. Um, and it's going to, it's going to cover uh, each individual area that I cover in um, at quite a superficial level. But if you have questions, as Candace says, uh, please don't hesitate to um, ask. Uh, we can go into things a bit more uh, deeply. The, uh, the idea with the presentation is to um, start discussion and give you ideas. So um, by all means, uh, you know, jump in uh, whenever throughout the presentation. If you um, if you have questions or um, comments or anything like that, um, so just to give sort of a, a brief orientation, uh, I'm going to start off by um, just firstly defining the ground, explaining what I mean when I'm uh, talking about embedded systems, and then I'll move on to give a high level tour of embedded related projects in the Linux space. So um, I'll, I'll go through that in roughly three levels. So I'll start off talking about um, embedded projects that are tool systems, the, um, you know, a, com a complete thing. Uh, and then I'll uh, drill down a bit to talk about uh, the operating systems that people use um, in an embedded context on Linux, or using Linux rather. Um, and then I will go, go down another level to talk about some of the individual programs that those operating systems use. So um, the Linux kernel is one example of those, but there are um, there are a few others. So uh, yeah, like I say, very high level talk, um, mainly pointers to useful information projects. And um, the focus here is on um, free software. So I've skipped over a few things that are um, are out there and use Linux, but are mainly uh, proprietary. So to start off with, um, what do we mean when we talk about an embedded system? Um, frankly, it's kind of a fuzzy concept. Um, you can write formal definitions, um, but any formal definition that you write, there's going to be um, places at the edges where, um, where the, the definition doesn't apply, either something sort of fits in the definition, but nobody looking at it would say it was an embedded system, or um, things clearly to everybody concerned look like embedded systems, but um, they don't fit the definition for whatever reason. So um, what I'll say is that um, for the purposes of this talk uh, is, is kind of fuzzy, uh, but it, it's about um, how developers and users interact with the system. So from a development point of view, um, with an embedded system, you're um, thinking about um, hardware. You're thinking about very specific hardware, a, a particular a particular machine, not not just um, a device within a machine, but it's a system as a whole. And you're thinking about that at a very uh, low level, interacting with the hardware. What very specifically will that hardware do? Um, and from a user point of view, you're um, thinking about something which you probably know that there's a computer there, but you don't really interact with it as a general purpose computer. You interact with it as some level of um, fixed function device, uh, which does a thing. And some of how it does that thing is, um, is based on software, but um, it's not really important to how you deal with the thing that, that that's the case. You're, you're dealing with um, the system as a whole. And the development side of that gets influenced by uh, or the development side of thinking about things gets influenced by meeting the user uh, that user need, and um, the user side of that um, is uh, partly a function. Or yeah, the, and the user side of that is partly a function of what the developers are doing. So um, hopefully that makes some sense. I don't know. Uh, please, uh, I assume. Um, so. Um, when uh, when people uh, when you say embedded system, the first thing people often th uh, think of is um, 
the small um, single board computers that um, are, are commonly uh, are quite widely used. So here, here's a couple of examples. I've got um, one here physically as well to give you an idea of how um, big these things typically are. They can be much bigger. Uh, so these are small um, Linux. Uh, these are small systems which can run Linux, um, and they're a complete uh, computer on uh, a single small board. So um, they've got USB, so you can plug a keyboard and a mouse in. They've got Ethernet uh, and Wi-Fi, so you can connect them to a network. Uh, and they've got, uh, although it's not so visible in these pictures here, HDMI, so you can connect up a monitor. So you can deal with them just as a computer. But what's really um, interesting with, about these, uh, from the point of view of them being embedded, is um, is the connect, uh, connectors they've got that allow you to uh, plug extra hardware onto them. So if you look at the um, back, uh, I can't point to this. Uh, can anybody see my uh, my pointer on the screen? Yes, we can see that. Oh, oh you can see my pointer. Oh, great. Yeah. That, that's very helpful, I thought. Um, so yeah, so if you, if you look at the... Um, this connect uh, this here. Uh, you can see that there's a bunch of uh, pins that uh, you can plug something into, and there's the equivalent thing uh, on this board here uh, down there. That I'm just pointing out just now. Um, so th uh, these bring out um, a bunch of electrical interfaces that um, the uh, the computer has. Uh, and what what uh, and what, what people do uh, what people can do with these that really uh, make the difference with these things being embedded systems is you can build extra hardware that plugs onto um, onto these systems. So, for example, onto onto these uh, connectors. So, for example, this board that I just waved in front of the camera uh, earlier um, actually, uh, actually has. A small module plugged in, uh, plugging into the uh, the equivalent pins on it. On it, uh, this is a Raspberry Pi, by the way, original Raspberry Pi. And so th th this small module um, extends this Raspberry Pi, which doesn't have any audio functionality normally. To have uh, what is, according to the manufacturers, a very high quality audio thing, uh, so you can make a hi-fi system with it. Um, and and this, and this is a a common way of putting together a computer for some sort of um, fixed function, uh, uh, fixed function purpose. It gets used a lot by people uh, working themselves, just as um, hobbyists, uh, but also is quite commonly used in industrial applications. So um, it's a lot easier to usually to design the custom hardware you need for your application um, than it is to design a, a complete system. So uh, what a lot of people who need, uh, need want to make hardware do is they take one of these systems, they design uh, just the hardware they need, and then they um, use the off-the-shelf uh, computer that's um, available on the market. Of course, sometimes um, that's not what you need. You need some, uh, you need the entire um, device to be built to your specifications. Um, so in that. Uh, uh, so people also um, build complete Linux systems from the ground up, um, every, everything from the uh, silicon upwards. Uh, so here's a, a couple of examples. Over, over on the left here, we've got um, an Android smartphone. This is pr uh, quite possibly the most common embedded Linux system that some uh, people will have dealt with. I imagine um, a lot of you have one of these in your uh, hands already. Uh, and over on the right here, we've got the uh, Steam Deck. This is a gaming console that uh, runs Linux, but the uh, users users of these systems never really deal with them as Linux systems. On Android, you're um, dealing with the Android operating system. You're installing apps on it, but you don't really uh, have general control over the system. And similarly, on the Steam Deck, you install your games on it, but you do, um, in normal use, you never encounter anything to do with um, the uh, the underlying operating system. It's all just a, a games and a system for loading games. However, you can go to the other extreme. You you can have something that people um, deal with as a system, 
but there's um, basically nothing um, custom about it. So this is an example of an embedded product I worked on many, many years ago. Um, this is, um, well, its function is to be a phone exchange for an office. Um, but, um, the, the users of this system, uh, you know, they, they'd buy this box, um, they'd install it, um, they would, uh, and they, they would interact with it via a, a web application that the thing ran. But if you, uh, if you open up this box, uh, this system, what you'll see inside is that it's actually an off-the-shelf PC. Um, the, the only um, custom or the only interesting bits of this PC are that there is a PCI card sitting here, um, and this panel, uh, the the labeling is custom. But otherwise, it's just a PC, uh, the same sort of PC you would get in the st uh, in the store, more or less, just in a different case. But um, but because of the software running on it, it's uh, it's turned into an embedded system from the perspective, uh, at least from the perspective of the users, and also, frankly, from the perspective of the developers. Um, and even more to the edges of embedded systems, um, you've, uh, you've got modern laptops. So um, a modern laptop is a general purpose computer from the point of view of the user. However, it's also a very specific piece of hardware um, that needs to work in um, and, and enabling that hardware requires the developers to uh, supporting it to understand the specific hardware they're dealing with. So uh, they need to know, for example, how, uh, how many speakers there are, where the speakers are. Uh, they need to know not to make the speakers so loud that the uh, the case starts to rattle or anything like that. Um, and for some of the more advanced um, uh, features um, of the displays and of the uh, of the audio, you you uh, you really care about the um, physical uh, the physical system itself. So from a development point of view, while users are dealing with this as a um, as a general purpose computer, from a development point of view, um, the people working to support these systems are basically doing embedded development, you know, in, in terms of how they think about things and how they deal with things. So um, does this make sense to people? Or are there any questions so far? There are no questions at this time, Mark, um, in the chat or um, okay. They, feel free to ask questions, um, everybody. If you, there is right. So, I, yeah. So, I saw some comments going fast. They're a bit fast for me to keep up with. Right. Um, so, um, um, sorry, hands are going up. Um, if you want to uh, take for, take one yeah. or two questions, let me see who has their hand up. Um, Alexandra, if you have a question, just unmute yourself and ask. Oh, okay. I guess, um, yeah. If you have a question, just ask or type it in the chat or Q and A. Me or? Um, there is a hand up. No, you're, you're, um... Oh, sorry. I, I think I I, cl I clicked back some people while I was switching some windows. Sorry. Okay. No worries. Sorry, apologies. No worries. Oh, no worries. No worries. Um. Okay, so there is um, okay, there is one question, uh, Mark. It's a, a longer question. I can try to um, read it out to you, or uh, it's in the chat. Would you like me to read that out to you? Uh, yeah, no, that that that's uh, that's fine. I can uh, summarize. So this is from um, Majid, mm -hmm. um, who's um, uh, ask uh, who's saying that. Um, there is a lot of challenges with um, assembly uh, uh, because there's a lot of software on a typical Linux system needs to be assembled and uh, developers need to um, understand what they're doing, select the correct version of the kernel and um, develop support for their the features that are unique to their system. Uh, so he's asking if the problem lies uh, in the choice of system. Um, so, um, Yes. Um, uh, so yeah, um, that that is certainly um, a big um, a big part of the. I wouldn't say it's the only challenge by by a long stretch, but yeah, yeah, uh, working out um, where to start from is definitely a big challenge uh, that faces people um, 
working in um, with embedded systems that you um, often what people do is they look at um, what other people are using for similar uh, product and systems and they um, do something similar uh, often there's um, what are called uh, reference designs uh, so these are um, uh, no I don't have one to wave, wave the camera right now uh, so the, these are um, systems that uh, chip manufacturers or uh, other people put together uh, that are intended to provide an example of sort of how you could make a system. They're not um, they're not properly finished. They've usually got a lot of uh, rough edges, but they're intended to uh, help people with the problem you raise of uh, figuring out where to, where to start from. Um, Yep. So you're you're saying yeah. In summary, uh, your question is how how to choose the right system to start from. Yes. Yeah, so um, and and this this uh, concept of the reference system is uh, and looking at what um, other people are doing in the same space uh, is often a uh, a good place to go with that. It's you you take something that somebody sort of integrated, maybe um, ninety percent. Um, and then you uh, customize both the hardware and the software to make whatever it is uh, you want to do. Uh, and if you're doing something uh, truly new, then the pro uh, completely different to everybody else, then the problem gets a lot harder. Um, but usually you're not dealing uh, completely with um, a, uh, a green field. You, usually you, you, uh, your system is based on something. Uh, either in hardware or software terms, um, and you uh, and so you can then take uh, take a look at how whatever it was your system is built on was um, support uh, uh, was put together, and you can uh, use that as a starting point and um, customize it. And yes, as Angel uh, says in the chat, uh, don't reinvent the wheel. So um, I see there's also a question from. Sala, uh, hopefully I've not mispronounced your name too badly. Um, asking if users can take a backup of uh, files in embedded system uh, to somewhere else. And that's something that um, really depends on how the um, the person or the people making the embedded system have uh, built the system. Some systems um, are built in a, a way that would allow that. Some systems aren't. It, it's really a feature of the the system. Uh, I mean, some systems don't even have any enough state on them to uh, have files that you might want to uh, back up. So, um, yeah, it, it's that's. Um, so the question just vanished from me. Uh, so yeah, so that that that's. Uh, that's a thing that could be possible in some systems, but um, isn't necessarily uh, guaranteed to be available. It's some. It's a feature that the system would have to have that the um, the developers would have to implement. Um. Okay. Looks like we have another question in the chat uh, from Fabio. Do you have a scorecard for the most popular and or promising platform? Um, so not, um, not really. Um, so I, I mean, I, I will, uh, like a lot, a lot of what the rest of the presentation is, frankly, is, is going through and um, talking around a bunch of different, um, different platforms. Um, I think that's, um, that's not really a question that it's, um, it's possible to um, answer you, you uh, answer because the um, different uh, platforms are designed with uh, very different purposes in mind. Uh, so, for example, a um, a system that's built to be a mobile phone will be very focused on things like uh, power consumption, and for modern phones where people expect fancy graphics and uh, high speed networking. Um, you know, th those will be, you know, key features that uh, people care about enabling. But um, on the other hand, a system that's designed to uh, run, say, an industrial process or 
uh, control the elevators in a building or something uh, will uh, maybe be designed uh, with, you know, they'll probably be plugged into the mains. They don't really care about power consumption. Um, but but they, uh, unlike a phone, they'll be expected to last for, say, 10, 20 years. And so um, there's a whole bunch of other considerations that come there with in terms of availability of components, um, reliability of the hardware um, that are just not relevant for or interesting for mobile phones. So... Yeah, I, I don't think you can make an you can give a specific answer to that question. Um, I think that's something that you have to, um, if you're thinking about doing something in, a, in the embedded space, you have to um, can look at and consider for yourself and um, work out what matters to you, and then select a system that um, both hardware and software that will um, deliver what it, uh, the things that you need to make your system work well. So speaking of systems, um, let, let, let's start going through, um, if there's no further questions, let's start going through our um, tour of uh, some of the system level uh, software that's out there. There we go, there we go. Um, yeah, so the, the, the first one I'll mention is um, Android. That's... Um, Obviously, uh, very popular uh, in the mobile space. It's um, um, it, it, that's that's what it's uh, primarily there for. Uh, but it's not some. It's not actually just for phones. It's um, very widely used in general. Um, that that comes from um, uh, that comes from a uh, a, a couple of. Um, of places. One is that uh, chip manufacturers see that there's a lot of um, phones being sold and they want to um, get into that market. So they um, they target a lot of their software support at um, at the phone uh, at the phone market and then people uh, want to use those chips in other applications. So they, they pick them up and they pick up the software that came with the, ch uh, the chips, um, which happens to be based on Android. Um, and the other thing is that um, while Android is intended for phones, it's also just a general um, user interface for um, custom hardware um, that can be repurposed with a bit of work for other things. So uh, people um, already have skills or know people with skills in um, in, in Android, um, and they... Um, and so they build their system on Android, so they, they can uh, reuse all their user interface. Um, they, they can reuse all, all their user interface design and implementation knowledge um, with a familiar system, and also um, get third-party apps, maybe depending on what the uh, the application is. So, um, in terms of de uh, developing Android itself, uh, rather than um, developing with Android, the, the two big areas that people work on are um, device support, so enabling systems to run uh, run Android, uh, whether that's uh, new hardware or maybe sometimes keeping older hardware running newer versions of Android, um, and all, also working on um, adding OS features that um, are needed for whatever application they have. So maybe feature for controlling real time, maybe some uh, fancy multimedia things. Um, who knows? Uh, it, uh, the, sky, the sky's the limit, really, when it comes to thinking of applications. Um, but um, unfortunately, um, for uh, people not working for big companies, um, Android uh, itself is uh, mostly developed, it, while, while it is open source, it's uh, mostly developed uh, within Google uh, with their uh, partners for um, for uh, applic uh, specific applications. So um, a lot of the uh, community effort around Android is centered on uh, Lineage OS, uh, which is a project that takes the uh, open source releases that uh, Google do uh, from the Android uh, that the Android project within Google does. 
uh, and they then they build on that so they they um they do a bunch of work in both supporting hardware um so like I said, uh, like I mentioned keeping old phones running is a big part of that um and also um enabling os features that uh people want so uh, uh, one reason you might run lineage os is because there's something you really want you uh, lineage os happens to have it so um sandeep in the chat um uh, mentioned that uh, he's seen um Android used for car dashboards, exercise machines, and um, point of sale machines. Um, yep, uh, all good examples. Yeah, I actually have an exercise machine um, sitting in the other room in my flat here, which uh, runs Android. And uh, Majid is um, asking for uh, recommendations for uh, securing embedded systems. Um, so that that's a um, that uh, that that's a very open ended um, ended question um, when you ask about uh, securing things. So um, one um, the the important thing with security is to think of what the um, attacks you're uh, you're worried about are and uh, working out how to uh, both try and stop them happening, obviously, uh, and um, and how to uh, mitigate problems if they do happen. So, um, th like, there's big things you can do, like um, not connecting your system to the internet. Uh, if if your system has no uh, network connection, then they're... Um, there, uh, there's a lot less of your system that somebody can talk to and uh, make it do un untoward things. Um, if you must connect your system to the internet, make sure you can ship software updates for it uh, and provide those updates promptly. Um, um, in terms of um, in terms of non-network things. Um, sort uh, yeah, Tim Bird has linked to uh, in the chat to um, some security recommendations. Um, thanks, Tim. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, in 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 term in terms of making your um, of avoiding the system doing untoward things um, based on somebody who can physically access the system, it's a lot tougher. Um, you need to make sure that. Um, whatever ways people can physically interact with the system um, only do the things that they're supposed to do which um, in turn depends on um, what those things are and this you know this comes back to the backup question that was um, asked earlier you know um, if you're supporting somebody plugging in a usb drive uh, say and copying files onto it then you need to start worrying about um, what will happen if somebody put, plugs in a malicious USB drive um, that may be trying to trigger some software bug on your system? So that's kind of a rambling answer, but um, hopefully that's um, helpful pointers, at least, to things. And uh, like I say, um, Tim's um, link there, uh, it, which is to the embedded Linux uh, wiki, uh, should... Uh, Um, yeah, it should, um, should hopefully have a bunch of stuff that's a bit more practical and useful and less um, less hand wavy. <laughs> um, and uh, Eric has asked um, in the Q and A's about um, secure distribution upgrades. Um, I don't have a, uh, a link off the top of my head like Eric asked for. Uh, that I could uh, point to, um, but uh, I would suggest checking out the embedded Linux wiki, and in particular, the um, there's a list of presentations there on um, from the embedded Linux conference over the years, um, and I know that there have been um, some talks uh, done at ELC in the past about 
um, over the year updates, which uh, hopefully would point you in roughly the right direction. But yeah, I'm afraid I can't. Um, I don't have anything immediately to hand uh, off the top to hand off the top of my head. And just um, I ah, and there's another uh, question from uh, from Sandeep about. Uh, Deve uh, driver and, and uh, development and debugging. Um, so I, I was going to mention the kernel uh, later on towards the end of the presentation. Um, so if uh, sure, if you could remind me to talk about that uh, that topic uh, later on when I get to the kernel bit, that would be great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I'll do that. Thanks. Right, so um, moving on, right, yep. Uh, yeah, so the, there. Uh, if you don't like Android for whatever reason, there are a few other uh, phone and tablet focused OSs that you can, uh, you can look at. Uh, one of the most interesting ones is Postmarket OS, which is um, a from scratch um, implementation of, um, of something that's essentially an Android competitor, um, it's um, yeah, it's it's an inter interesting project to check out. Uh, and there, there's also Ubuntu Touch, uh, which is um, was originally developed by Canonical, although they now don't really work on it so much, and it's now entirely done by uh, Community, uh, the Community, which is as um, the name suggests. Uh, basically a port of Ubuntu to work on um, on phones and phone type hardware like uh, tablets uh, and Plasma Mobile is a similar idea for KDE the um, desktop environment it's um, the KDE developers uh, taking KDE and adapting it to mobile so um, yeah those are uh, those are interesting projects to check out um, if you um, want to work on a on a phone type hardware, uh, but you're not so um, uh, you're not so interested in Android for whatever reason. Um, and another big area, and pro probably one of the er earliest areas for embedded Linux, is um, networking. Uh, so th th this comes at um, all scales. The the interesting thing here is that Linux has a very powerful and flexible network stack. Um, it's probably the most powerful and flexible network stack out there. Certainly the most powerful and flexible one that um, you can readily get access to. But um, consumer products based, uh, and even frankly, a lot of enterprise products be, uh, based on um uh, based on Linux don't really let users get um, access to the um anything like the potential of um, um of the of the stack you 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 can't do um very much with them at all so um one of the uh, um to open DDWRT and open wrt are both projects which take um Mostly consumer grade routers, uh, just things you can buy in the store, um, and then they replace the the firmware on those systems with um, custom firmware, which um, aims to provide uh, to let people do whatever they want and can uh, with the Linux networking stack. So that could be um, setting up VPNs, that could be advanced firewalling, that could be um, trying to prioritize traffic. Um, could be separating out different um, devices on your internal network from each other. Um, really, it, it's um, a sky's the limit thing in terms of um, what the um, what you can imagine doing uh, and what you uh, and what the, what yeah, what you can try and accomplish with the, the software. So, um, in technical terms. Um, there's two there's two big bits to these things um and, and they're both very similar projects by the way they they um 
they're r doing roughly the same thing in very similar ways. There's there's some differences I don't want to get into. Don't frankly don't really understand. Never mind, want to get into right now. Uh, but in, so in in technical terms, there's two bits to um, what's going on here. Um, there's the kernel bit where uh, people take, uh, implement support for the various devices that are out there. Um, so that's um, things like uh, making sure that the, uh, or get, getting a kernel that can work on on the device uh, and then making sure that the, the kernel works as well as it possibly can. So optimizing the performance of the networking hardware and anything else that's relevant. Uh, for example, enabling features um, that maybe can be supported in the hardware but aren't for whatever reason. Um, and then there's also the applications that run um, on the system. And these for, for both DDWRT and OpenWRT are um, primarily web applications. So uh, um, in, when an end user is dealing with one of these systems and configuring it, Usually they will um, try and go in via the web interface. And so, and that web interface will then configure the Linux networking stack to do uh, whatever um, whatever the user needs, well, you know, whether that's, you know, setting up a VPN, uh, monitoring traffic, um, firewalling things, um, if, yeah, what, whatever. Uh, so um, there's a bunch of, um, web type development that um, you can do in an embedded context. Um, yeah, you know, using in these projects. Uh, and in fact, um, I think both of these projects are actually used by some commercial routers. There, there's some router vendors have decided um, that they want to sh ship a, um, um, you know, more powerful software than their, their competitors. So they, they, you know, they've gone and taken um, the, these, uh, these distributions and uh, use that as the firmware for their routers. Um, IP Fire is um, slightly different. IP Fire is more targeting um, sort of uh, an office type uh, enterprise um, application, but it, it's kind of a similar idea. Uh, but rather than running on um, some uh, a, a consumer router, that's usually targeted at running on um, a PC. And is more um, um, yeah. The, the, in many ways, the goals are kind of similar, but the the focus of the project is different. And, it's tar um, and so the the, uh, the way it presents itself to users is different. Um, uh, and they also have a burning penguin as a logo. So there's that. <laughs> um, in the chat, I see there's some more questions. Um, I think it's more of a comment than a question, but yeah, if you want to take a look at that, Mark. Uh, yes, that's more of a, yes, that's more of a statement than a, a question. <laughs> yep. Oh, my camera's doing something. There we go. <laughs> um, okay, so if there's no questions on the networking type applications, Let's uh, move on to home automation. So th this is this is quite an interesting area that's uh, that's fairly new, or at least the wide adoption of it's fairly new. Um, so I'd, uh, many of you will be familiar with um, things like um, Apple's HomeKit and Google's Home. So uh, systems for um, controlling uh, and monitoring um, the environment in your home. Um, sort of measuring temperatures, turning on and off switches, um, detecting whether people are present, and maybe triggering actions either uh, from a computer or a phone or um, automatically based on some of the uh, things like you know things like temperature monitoring, setting the uh, con controls for your thermostat. Uh, so the, um, there's a couple of big projects um, based on Linux that. Um, work in this space named to provide uh, free and open versions of uh, these systems. Um, so they're linked here, uh, Home Assistant and um, uh, Home Assistant and OpenHab. 
Uh, so who uh, they're in in terms of what they do, they're um, they're very similar. Um, the uh, the difference between the two is as far as to my understanding, um, and I'm not super familiar with either project, frankly. Uh, is more of a, a focus on in, on how um, how they present themselves to users. So Open Hub is a bit more low level and a bit more focused on people who really want to tinker, whereas uh, Home Assistant is more aiming for something that's uh, more polished and end user targeted. Um, but there's still scope within uh, each for the applications of the other. It, it's just a more a question of emphasis and slightly different communities. So in um, in terms of how these systems are put together, um, they're very similar to um, DDWRT, OpenWRT, and IP Fire. They're um, applications with primarily a web user interface, um, some uh, some control uh, via apps as well. Um, they can run all, um, on generic um, single board computers like the ones I uh, showed before. Um, for both of, uh, for both of these, you typically need um, some sort of radio to talk to accessories. So, for example, uh, temperature monitors or uh, what have we. Um, so th those could either be on your board, uh, on your embedded system, or uh, you know maybe plugged in via USB to it. Um, and often these, um, because these systems are designed to automate your home and hence be running all the time uh, people want to select uh you know pe people want to select uh, uh, the lowest power hardware they can to keep their energy costs down so um they'll typically want to use um, some sort of embedded board for that reason as well uh, pe uh, the, these they're often a bit uh, more power efficient than um than a de desktop computer is so i, I see there's a question in the chat, which um, uh, um, Angel is, mm -hmm. there is a question, Mark, and then I tried to answer it, just expand on it if you, uh, I think they're asking for it, if there is a bigger map. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so a Angel's asking if um, there's uh, a reference to map, uh, a, a reference to map in match embedded systems uh, boards to the sources in the kernel, um, and uh, she was saying that vendors do um, sometimes provide a, uh, a repository, um, which, um, yeah. So I I'll. I'll cover this one a bit later when I talk about device tree. I think. I mean, I, the, the the short answer is that they're not really, um, not really one central thing. Usually, you're better off looking at the starting from the documentation for your particular board. Uh, but you you can sort of trace things through from the um, description of the hardware. But I'll I'll cover that later when I mention um, device tree. Um, so yeah, sure. Again, if you could remind me about that, if I um, if I forget. Yeah, yeah, I'm on it. I have a couple of questions. I'm taking notes on to remind you. Great, thanks. Um, okay, um, so if there's no questions specifically on home automation, uh, then the last area that um, let's go uh, mention for uh, where there's there's full system um, products that you can get. Uh, is uh, storage so um it's an it, this is another one that's um um the the pe people have been working on uh, with linux for a long time so again as with networking linux has a uh, very advanced uh, storage and very flexible storage system and there's lots of support for uh network protocols as well so um people will um Often try and build systems which try, uh, which take the um, Linux storage stack and make it available over the the network in various forms. Um, three of the big ones here, or three of the big open source ones here, 
Um, so th there's a rock store, which is a generic um, discs, uh, shared discs on, on your local network focused product or system. Um, so that's, um, again, um, as, for, um, as with so many of these things, it's uh, primarily a web application. It uh, also runs um, networking file system uh, software as well. Um, and it runs on a variety of hardware from uh, sort of off-the-shelf PC hardware um, to, uh, to embedded boards. Um, that that's um, and as well as well as um, just sharing files, um, it, it's also grown some um, some support uh, some support for other uh, related things. Um, so uh, things where you might want to uh, where you have a lot, of, uh, you might want to access the files in the store on your storage. Um, so uh, things like streaming media is is a big part of that. Um, and you know, d doing backups, um, things like that. Um, so it's, it's not just about um, storage. So um, Open Media Vault is kind of similar. Um, it's very much more focused on um, storage uh, on um, streaming media, though. So um, things like uh, cataloging your movies, your um, audio files um, and then providing mechanisms to get at them and um, you know find the media you want and view it um, and finally uh, enterprise storage OS ESOS um, that's um, very, a very different thing that that's more uh, much more targeted at um, like the name suggests um, enterprise it's um, about providing um, storage technologies like iSCSI, which does have free and open implementations um, over the network using uh, commodity or relatively commodity hardware. Um, so that that's less interesting to the average home user, but equally well, it can be fun to play with. Um, so I see some more questions have popped up. Uh, so Majid is asking if there's resources regarding uh, Linux in biometric systems. I am sure there are. I don't have any offhand. Uh, maybe Tim will be able to jump in with some, uh, or uh, Alexandru has um, jumped in and linked to a project called fPrint, which I know nothing about. Um, but yeah, uh, I, 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 I don't know, but yes, I, I'm, Certain there are, uh, and Pop has uh, uh, has asked uh, what my opinion is on using Rust versus C and C plus plus. I, I think Rust looks fun. I think um, I think it's a good choice. Uh, it does help with some things. There's a learning curve though, and it's relatively new. I think thanks to you is also linked to. Uh, some uh, some other software as well. Um, but yeah, um, yes, I, I think it's an exciting technology that's uh, worth uh, definitely worth investigating. But um, there's a lot of new ground. Um, there's not a lot of new ground to cover, so I, I wouldn't um, necessarily re completely reject the use of Scene Plus Plus just yet. It's a bit early days for that. And um, uh, Chen Chung, again, apologies if I'm mispronouncing names here, um, is asking if there are projects around um, cars and car entertainment systems. So that's definitely a thing people do uh, commercially. I am not aware of um, anything that's uh, generally available to sort of random people not making cars to work on. Um, there probably are, especially for the um, entertainment systems. Um, but I, I'm i not aware of them. I, I can't provide pointers, I'm afraid. Sorry. If anybody else in the chat has any um, 
ideas, um, please do uh, link them. That would be very helpful. So, and yeah, Alexandra has um, provided a bit of explanation to what fprint is as well. That's that's good. Um, thanks, thanks, Alexandru. Um, yep. So, mo moving on to the the software um, the software distributions. Um, so, one thing you can do when you're putting together your embedded system is you can just use a standard desktop Linux distribution and run it on your uh, embedded hardware. Um, this is often a, a really good uh, choice. Um, it, can, uh, it, can, it, can, it can work well. Um, a lot of the single board computers do ship images for say Ubuntu or Debian or Fedora. Um, the big advantage with the standard desktop distributions is, uh, for most developers, is familiarity. So you can uh, you can run your software in an environment that's um, very similar to what you've got on your laptop or your desktop or whatever it is you use as your daily driver computer. Uh, and you also have access to all the things that have been packaged for that distribution in the same way that they're packaged when you use them on your um, uh, when you uh, when you use them on your uh, laptop or desktop, um, the disadvantage um, um, the the disadvantage uh, is that um, you uh, you're dealing with a distribution that was put together primarily for use on laptops, desktops, or maybe depending on the distribution um, servers. So. Um, Sometimes you find that um, things don't fit very well to an embedded context. So, for example, um, things might want to start up a GUI, which uh, maybe your system doesn't actually have a GUI. So that's that's um, an issue. And maybe the system isn't so easy to use without the GUI, um, or maybe the system is just uh, the you know the the OS you're familiar with is just a bit too big and heavyweight for the small board you're uh, trying to run on. So uh, yeah, in the, in the chat, uh, Prasad is um, asking for some from gu some guidance on getting started, and Shua says starting small with a Raspberry Pi um, is a good idea. Yeah, I I, I fully agree with Shua there. Um, like what one of these small embedded boards? Um, some of them are expensive, but there's an awful lot of them are quite um, are quite cheap and easy to get hold of, relatively speaking. So um, the, you know, yeah, they're they're definitely a good place to start in terms of hardware. And the, the other thing um, I think um, really helps with this sort of thing is finding a problem uh, you want to solve or a goal you want to achieve, and uh, working towards that. So, as you can see from the um, er uh, the area I've covered already in terms of the 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 systems, just it saying. Embedded Linux is, you know, it, it's a very broad and poorly directed um, uh, topic. Um, so, um, and it, it can be easy to get lost going down um, different alleys, looking at different things, unless you have a particular goal in mind. Um, so, if it works better for you, it, it can really help to um, think of. Um, to, th uh, to th think of something you're trying to accomplish, you know, maybe um, sharing files from a, a, a NAS would be good, or may maybe um, something like some basic home automation stuff, um, you know, monitoring the temperature in your house or something. Um, that might be uh, might be an interesting project to get started on. Just, you know, thinking of something you want to do and trying to accomplish that goal can provide a lot of good direction. Um in terms of you know when you're trying uh, when you're trying to get going and trying to get a grasp on things, it, it's a very big area. So finding something, finding this, the small bit that you um, you want to look at um, can help focus thing and help uh, help focus your work and help focus your learning. And 
Uh, Sasha Van, again, apologies if I'm mispronouncing names, is, is asking if embedded system support is available in Kali. I do not know off the top of my head. Um, hopefully somebody in the chat does. Um, if not, I would look at their website and see if they support, um, you know, see, see what systems they say they support. If they say they support um, ARM, My um, video is still working. Audio working. Video froze for a little bit, Mark. Okay, good. Yeah, I, I saw well, the video freezing. I was yeah. worried it would fall <laughs> over. Um, and you were saying that when you when the audio cut out, you were saying that uh, check uh, call, uh, the Kali Linux site, and you started to say ARM systems, if they support yeah. ARM systems. Yep. Yep. So yeah, if if these, um, yeah, it, yeah, basically check what uh, what systems they support and if they look embedded ish. Um, uh, as uh, Alexander and the um, and Kanak in the chat are saying, uh, yeah, the smaller Intel systems might be considered embedded as well, uh, and um, yeah. Uh, Kali is just, you know, Kali, Kali is a Linux distro, as Kanak says. So um, it's entirely possible it supports um, embedded systems already. Maybe if it doesn't, though, maybe that's an interesting project to work on if people are looking for um, embedded projects to get started with. Uh, because, yeah, it should be, if, if it doesn't support uh, embedded systems right now, uh, I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be possible for it to work on such things. Absolutely. One more thing to add is Kali Linux, as I understand, is a based on Cell Linux. So uh, for people looking at uh, security aspects of uh, embedded systems, Kali could be, if it supports embedded, it might bring some of the Cell Linux features. Mm. Indeed, yeah. All right. Um, yep, so um, looking at the time, better move on a bit. Um, so just um, in, in uh, another distribution to mention, uh, I wanted to touch on, or a thing I want to touch on briefly in the distribution section is um, Android. Um, so Android, um, like I mentioned, it's uh, widely used um, in, the, in the embedded sphere. It's, um, it, um, it's basically a completely independent ecosystem to the rest of it, Linux, apart from the kernel. Um, so, uh, if you're working with Android, you're probably not working with other Linux technologies other than the the kernel. Um, but yeah, if it, it, it's not much more to say about it in term, uh, as a distribution, um, just that it's um, yeah. If you're selecting Android, then that's selected your full software stack for you. Um, yeah. So as as well as the sort of generic. Um, desktop distributions. There are also um, a couple of um, distributions that are specifically targeted at, um, at embedded systems. So the, the smallest and simplest of them is uh, BuildRoot. This is um, really, uh, this is really um, simple, uh, a, a really simple system to get, uh, get going with. It's designed to build everything you might run on your device uh, from scratch, giving you uh, full control over what uh, what goes on there. Um, it's got a nice, um, simple um, configuration. It's got an, an, a nice, simple configuration scheme, and yeah, um, it's a, a quite often a good place to start if you want to go uh, build everything from the ground up and really see everything that's going on going um, onto your system. Something that's a bit bigger and uh, more uh, a lot more flexible is Yocto. Uh, Yocto isn't exactly a distribution. It's um, more a, um, a framework for uh, building operating systems, if you like. Um, it's um, 
there, there is a uh, it's designed around the concept of uh, layering. So with Yocto, you um, you combine software from uh, a bunch of different sources, some of which will be standard off the shelf ones. So for example, uh, there's basic things with the uh, very lowest level software like the kernel in there. There's um, extra layers that you can get, which um, add support for all the hardware that you might find on a given SOC. Um, and you can also add in um, off the shelf layers for a bunch of standard applications. And then you can write your own layer for your, uh, your custom stuff. And then Yocto will uh, work out how to combine all these things, uh, work out what it needs to do and build a full operating system image for you. Um, that makes it sound a bit complicated. It's not quite as complicated uh, as I've made it sound. Um, it's um, it's very easy to get going with there, but there's a lot of um, depth and flexibility to it. If uh, So if you run into problems with build root, not being able to do um, the things you need to do, then uh, Yocto is a good place to uh, to move on to and, um, and look around for um, for things to work with. It's um, it's the same idea as build root. It will it will build everything you want to run on your uh, system. Uh, you uh, it will build all the software for your system from source. Um, you can see exactly what's going on there, and you can tinker with uh, everything on the system. So Salah is asking about dedicated um, groups uh, specifically uh, focused on beginners. Um, what I would say is um, probably a good place to start is the any of the any of the projects uh these or each of these projects will have their own community of some kind whether that's mailing lists irc's uh channels some of them have slack and discord or things like that as well um so you're finding something you're interested in learning more about and um looking at the, uh the resources for that um that project can be um is probably probably the best way into that i would say um, some of them are more uh, beginner focused than others. Some of them have uh, sort of introductory tutorial things, uh, easy or um, you maybe suggested bug lists that are easy to look at. Hopefully, um, but yeah, ho hopefully that's uh, hopefully that's useful. So, any more questions on the distributions or comments or? Uh, Shua is anticipating so uh, one of my um, <laughs> one of my later slides there. Uh, recommended Zephyr. <laughs> okay. Um, so in in uh, so and and Pedro is asking if you just need to build a, a minimal root file system, which software I would recommend. Uh, yeah, both build root and Yocto, as you say, will um, allow you to build a minimal system. Um, at, at, uh, at the small level, uh, the results from build root and Yocto, uh, Yocto are very uh, similar. Uh, the differences mainly cut, uh, between build root and Yocto mainly come into play when you want to do something uh, bigger and more complicated. Yocto has a lot more um, tunability and flexibility. But the, the cost of that tuning building flexibility is uh, that you can get a lot more complexity with it too. Um, so I would recommend looking at either of those projects and um, seeing what makes sense to you, what works for you. Um, they, they're both uh, perfectly suitable and good projects. Um, Personally, I uh, I tend to use um, uh, personally I tend to use uh, Yocto, uh, but that's mainly because I've been using it since before Build Root was a thing, rather than because there's any um, any specific reason to use it. Uh, and Majid is asking if there. Uh, I'm not actually. I'm not uh, Majid. I'm not clear what your question is. You're if you could clarify, maybe. Um, 
uh, while you do that, in the interest of time, I'm going to um, move on a bit um, and start uh, start talking about individual projects. So, um, obviously, this is a Linux Foundation thing. We're here to talk about embedded Linux. Um, a big part of embedded Linux is the Linux kernel. Um, there's two broad areas where uh, uh, where, pe uh, where people work on Linux in a uh, specifically embedded context. Uh, one of them is uh, hardware enablement. Um, uh, Canax asking if an industry build root or yacht are, are used. Yes, both of them. Um, they're, they're both uh, used commercially. Uh, so yeah, um, yeah. So w w probably the biggest area where people work on uh, Linux in embedded context, uh, on the kernel itself in embedded context, is on uh, hardware and is with hardware enablement. So that um, there's several layers where that happens. Um, at the um, simplest layer is uh, just describing the hardware so that uh, Linux knows how to work with it from, uh, you know, so Linux, uh, Linux can run on it without making any changes to the actual code of Linux. Uh, so I'll, I'll uh, that's a thing called device tree. I will uh, cover that a bit in a, um, one of my upcoming slides. Um, then once you've described the hardware, you need drivers that can ru uh, run on the hardware. Um, so that's that's the the other um, big area people work on. Um, shiny new hardware um, often needs shiny new code to make it do things. Um, so uh, people will, um, yeah, people will work on that either um, uh, either starting from scratch based on documentation from the vendor, or um, sometimes um, people will. Uh, provide uh, or uh, people will look at the software that the vendor has provided, either you know a system somebody who's shipped a system and has made a um, legally required source code release, or uh, perhaps the silicon vendor shipped some reference code that you can look at, uh, and they they will work out how to make um, upstream Linux work on their system, or you know their particular Linux version that they happen to have on their system work with the. Um, the hardware and you know so, sometimes um it's not just a question of doing the device specifics um it's not just the case that you've got an ethernet controller and you just write you can just write the standard ethernet controller integration uh, sometimes the hardware has some shiny new feature that no hardware support in linux has had before uh, so you have to go and implement features in the um at the uh, at a higher level of the Linux kernel to um, support uh, to support whatever it is your hardware can do, so Linux can understand the concept of what it's trying to accomplish. Um, so one uh, really simple example of that um, that um, I dealt with recently is in uh, relatively recently is an upstream maintainer. Um, the flash chips that uh, a lot of embedded boards use to store their operating systems. Um, Keep on getting. Um, originally, the, these were usually uh, usually just used a single uh, signal to transmit the uh, transmit data from the chip to the CPU, um, which was slow because you needed to uh, you need to uh, send every every single bit in, in of the image one after another. Um, so flash vendors started adding uh, support for sending two bit, uh, two, four, or sometimes even eight bits at once. Uh, but the Linux kernel didn't really understand how to do that. So we needed to add options um, to the system for talking uh, to the spy subsystem, which talks these chips um, to allow it to, uh, under, uh, to tell the spy controller in the CPU and the uh, flash chip that they should communicate with a higher uh, number of bit, uh, data lanes at once. Um, uh, so yeah, so that, that's hardware enablement. Um, 
and um, the other um, the other thing that people often work on is you know the hardware all functionally works, um, but um, maybe it doesn't work fast enough, or maybe um, maybe it's too power inefficient, or what, what you know there's some uh, there's some metric um that the system isn't doing very well on and you, you know that the hardware could do it you can see that the system is being inefficient uh but you need to uh but you need to do some software work to make sure that the kernel actually works well so people will go and they will try and optimize the kernel they will try and enhance the way it uh, deals with hardware um to make the kernel run more effectively on their hardware whatever they um uh, whatever the metric they need to uh, hit is. Um, so there have been a lot of questions just there, and I... Um, Mark, they're mostly... Uh, there aren't a, too many questions. They're mostly people talking, giving information to each other. Uh, one is, what are the advantages of building kernel with build root instead of building it from source? Um, that's probably one question there that could be answered. Um, okay, uh, yeah. So th there, it, it's. Um, I mean, build root will build the kernel uh, from sources part uh, part of what it's doing. the The main advantage of doing your kernel build from within build root rather than independent uh, independently uh, would um, is usually that build root will make a whole system image. You can just write onto an SD card or flash onto your device or what, uh, however it is you put it on there. Uh, so, if you, uh, but, uh, by, um, if you, uh, if you build thing, uh, if you build the whole system at once, then you, um, you, it's just one step to write that out onto your, uh, your device. Um, you can also find that there's some software which, uh, will, it be able to configure itself more optimally uh, if it knows exactly which kernel it's running on. So there's maybe features that depend on kernel options that are turned on or turned off, for example, that can be selected. So um, if you're if the thing that's building the applications and the user space knows exactly what the kernel it's work it's supposed to be working with is, it can uh, configure itself um, or it, it can configure the rest of the software to work um, optimally with the the kernel you're building. Mark, is this a good time for you uh, for me to remind you about the two questions that you wanted to answer during this time? Yes, um, I know there was one about uh, device tree. <laughs> uh, do you want me to just cut and paste them in the chat? Yeah, that, so that, that yeah, that, 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 that works. Yep. Okay, that's the first one. Right. So, um, yeah, techniques uh, techniques for. Um, developing and debug, uh, debugging drivers. Um, yeah, that's um, that's a tricky one. Um, it, it does depend a lot on um, how easy the, the hardware uh, you've got to work, is to work with, um, as you say, uh, or as the person who asked the question originally um, said. Um, The printf debugging is, or uh, print key in the case of the kernel, I guess, is um, unfortunately quite common here. Um, the yeah, um, it, it, it's um, th thanks for the reminder, Candice. Um, it, it's. Um, it, 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 it's a, a difficult question, which depends very much on the specific system you have and the um, specific uh, problems you face. Um, if you can get log messages out some way, that's um, a good, um, often good. You, you, um, you can do that. Uh, you can either trace what's happening, or you can put um, checks in the code to make sure that things that you would believe are true at a given point in time continue to be true. Um, and then you know display if there if it finds a problem. Um, 
you can if you've got storage you can uh, maybe put some of these store uh, log uh, that diagnostic information on a disk although there are challenges uh, with that when it comes to making sure that the things actually written out before things explode um and you can often get GDB if you've got networking or something. So connecting with a debugger is possible, um, often even, even if it's not very uh, easy. Um, in general, though, my advice is, or you know, my, my techniques tend to, uh, to be, uh, yeah, it tend to be that sort of printf, um, put asserts in there, make sure, you know, verify that everything's doing what you expect. Um, and think really hard about it. it it's not um, easy if the hardware isn't very um, well designed for uh, diagnostics, which, yeah, um, a fully integrated system often isn't. Um, I'm afraid there isn't anything really good or straightforward there. And the, the actually the other thing to to check out uh, there is uh, the. F trace subsystem. So the, there are a lot of facilities for putting um, hooks into the uh, kernel for adding extra logging with very low overhead, uh, which can be really, really useful. So you, you can trace huge volumes of information uh, with very low overhead without disrupting things in the way that you can if you're printing to, say, a serial console that's quite slow. Um, yeah. So moving on uh, to. Um, to the hardware description bit and um yep yeah, uh which uh and, yeah, the just, second just, question yep yeah, mark it's just remind me yep yeah. so um the way um most embedded linux systems describe their uh, hardware to the kernel is with um a special language called um device tree i don't have the time to go into in huge detail here um, I will just uh, give you a brief overview and some, uh, which you can go and check it out, um, check out the documentation for it. And, um, if you want, uh, if you want to learn more, uh, but what the, what the device tree, um, does is it writes, you write out, um, a description of what the hardware in the system is and how it's connected. Uh, and then. And the kernel um, looks at that description and then it loads uh, drivers based on uh, what it sees. So that's um, this de these device tree descriptions are often um, the best way to match up the drivers in the kernel with the uh, best way to uh, match up the drivers in the kernel with the um, the hardware on the board. And um, so you'll see. Is talking through this uh, this example here, which is for the GPU on um, on the Samsung phone socks. It, it seems. Um, so you see, this um, is just saying this is a GPU, and then this this line compatible here is the key one for matching drivers. So if you um, this uh, this says that um, this device is comp um, can be described with a string. Samsung Exynos 54433 five, uh, Mali and ARM Mali uh, T760. So um, when the kernel runs, it will look at these compatible strings and it'll, uh, it will go through its list of drivers, um, seeing dr uh, for any driver, uh, seeing if it's got a driver that says it supports either of those compatible strings. Um, and if there uh, is one, it will try and load that driver against the uh, it run with uh, with the, this hardware block. So if you've got a device tree for a board, you can look at the compatible strings for uh, you see listed in that device tree, and you can then go and look at the kernel and see what's supported. Uh, and then when the driver um, binds to the device, it looks at the um, the rest of the description of the device. Um, you, so here you see. Um, this line reg says there are some registers at um, this hardware address that are this big. Um, there are some interrupt signals that the um, that the uh, the device can use to um, tell the host something's happening. 
Um, and then we can have other um, other properties that co uh, customize the device. They'll they'll be defined in the um, uh, on a per device basis. Uh, Shua has linked in the chat to um, uh, to the documentation for this. Uh, I don't have time to go into it in any detail, so uh, yeah, please go and check out the documentation to see exactly how that works. Uh, one thing I will mention is that um, often your uh, your system will be um, there'll be a lot of different blocks of hardware that. Um, Uh, that need uh, that need to work together. So the um, the, the device tree will also show links between different things uh, or different components in the system. So here's a brief example. We have um, an MMC controller, a storage controller, uh, which needs some clocks. Um, one of uh, you can see here the I've bolded um, the name. Uh, there's a named clock uh, or a named um, device with an and in front of it. And then that reference is somewhere else uh, in the device tree, the device that provides that clock. Uh, so here we've got this Samsung Exynos 7 clock top one um, provides the clock top one that is, uh, is used by the MMC controller there. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, uh, there's a bunch of kernel subsystems that are um, mostly used in embedded uh, rather than uh, on desktop systems. So GPIOs are for simple um, uh, simple uh, individual wires. Uh, PWMs, pulse width uh, modulation, uh, is a sort of semi-analog uh, output from a, an SOC. Um, IIO is for um, any random sort of sensor or uh, analog output from a device. Uh, and the input display and audio subsystems, well, obviously they are used on uh, regular computers as well. Um, they're, um, there's uh, quite a bit of embedded work there too, because obviously you need to interact with your system somehow. Uh, yeah, uh, Pedro's asking if you uh, can load devices uh, after uh, the rootfus is loaded. You absolutely can. Um, so I'm going to uh, that, that just works the same way as it does on uh, a desktop. That that's uh, fully works. So I've got very little time left. So um, I will just briefly skate over the firmware section here. The, the two main um, firmware projects uh, for Linux are Ubuntu and Tiano Core. Um, frankly, in the embedded context, um, you're almost certainly going to be using Ubuntu. Uh, Tiano Core is mainly for uh, desktop systems, although there are a few embedded systems that uh, that use it. Um, so Ubuntu is, is a program that deals with the Early setup of the computer uh, of the board, uh, getting it um, working um, in the state that Linux needs to start, um, and it will also deal with uh, loading uh, the operating system from whatever storage the system has, getting into memory uh, ready to start. Um, yeah, again, I'm short on time, so I'm going to skate on quickly and mention uh, Zephyr, which uh, Shua mentioned before. Uh, so this is um, an, uh, a, a small operating system designed for um, either very small systems, too small to run Linux, or uh, also utility processors uh, running within a Linux system, but uh, separately. So um, th this is um, useful for situations where either your system doesn't have very many resources, or where you need to do something um, with very tight uh, time constraints. So um, one of the reasons I, um, or one, one of the main reasons you're likely to run into a Zephyr system uh, on a when you're running Linux is uh, a project called Sound Open Firmware, which is the DSP firmware that's used by most um, non-Qualcomm 
chips these days, including um, a lot of uh, Linux laptops, will use uh, sound open firmware uh, to deal with the uh, very bottom of the audio stack. So uh, yeah, if you have a, a small low power uh, or very small system or a real time need, uh, Zephyr is a good thing to check out. And that's the end of the presentation. And we have maybe three more minutes for um, for uh, questions. Or um, Candice, I don't I don't know if you want to take over already. Or you're more than welcome to to keep at answering questions. It looks like we might have just got one in the Q and A. I, so I see, yes. Um, so, um, uh, Ashkan is asking, uh, what are the potential use cases for eBPF and embedded Linux systems? So they're the same use cases as uh, for eBPF uh, anywhere else. Um, Um, it can be useful for the sort of monitoring and debugging things we're uh, mentioning earlier, actually. Um, it's useful for um, for uh, yeah, it, it's useful for it, yeah, it's useful for instrumenting things. It's useful for um, customizing the kernel without having to um, go and actually modify the kernel code. Um, Um, yeah, uh, so I'm not, I, I don't actually use EPPF very much, so I'm not super familiar with it other than the uh, sort of trace and debug applications. Um, but yeah, yeah, anything you can use EPPF for in a desktop system or a server, you can use it for an, the same things in an embedded system. Um, Pedro and Ravi are asking if and when the system will be available later. And yeah, Candace has uh, said it'll be available on the Linux Foundation YouTube channel. Um, and um, Yazid is asking uh, what the main benefit of Linux is. Um, so the, the, uh, the main um, thing I would say that you're getting with Linux is an awful lot of shared work. Um, so, um, especially like I was mentioning the the networking stack uh, or, and the storage stack earlier. Um, you know, there's a huge amount of work gone into making sure that, uh, or to, into making Linux a best in work class um, operating system for networking and a best in class operating system for. Um, for storage and um, you can just pick that work up and use it in your own thing for your own purposes. And certainly there's an awful lot of work gone into making sure that um, the various embedded SOCs out there work well in uh, with Linux. Um, and by uh, by taking Linux, uh, or by, by basing your your work your system on Linux, you can uh, take advantage of all that um, other work that people have done, um, and you really only have to deal with the things that are special for uh, for your system. Um, it's all um, the other great thing about um, Linux being open source is that, um, or specifically uh, due to Linux being open source, is that you have full access to the whole thing. So if you run into a problem um, with enough time and effort, then hopefully you can fix it yourself or find somebody you can hire who will um, fix it for you. So um, with proprietary systems, you're um, often stuck uh, waiting for a vendor to fix something for you if you run into a problem in the proprietary bits. Uh, by basing your uh, work on an open source system like Linux, you have uh, full control or more full control and you're much less at the mercy of um, external vendors. Um, that can be really important, especially if you have to support your product for a very long time. 
if it's one of these embedded systems that's uh, going to be deployed for 10 or 20 years, then um, knowing that you don't have to rely on a vendor uh, still being around in 10 or 20 years can be a very reassuring thing. So yeah, hopefully that answers that question. And I see that we're over time. So I should probably hand over to Candice to wrap the session up. If there... Thank you, Mark. This has been great. Um, that's, that's from my side. Thank you. Thank you, thank Mark, you. and thank you, Shua, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today, and a copy of the presentation slides will be added to the Linux Foundation website. We hope you are able to join us for future mentorship sessions. Have a wonderful day.